I lost my place. Start over. Also, there's a dog now. I apologize. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, okay, Rini. Oh, Rini. You're just gonna. No. <laughs> okay, she's just gonna settle in. Yeah. <laughs> I miss you so much. I miss you too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's been a it's been a it's been a, a decade this past two months. God. Three months. Did you, <sighs> <laughs> did you know that every Wednesday of this month has been a historical event? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. And guess what? It's gonna be Wednesday soon. I'm real scared. <laughs> you know, that's that's what the drinking's for. That's what, oh, uh, <laughs> so great. But but it has been what's, what's, what's passed since last time we spoke. Halloween. Oh yeah. For, for, oh my god. Yeah, it's been since Halloween. Oh my god. What'd you do for Halloween? <laughs> I'm just oh, curious. I sat on my patio and watched Nightmare Before Christmas and drank cider because okay, we have a projector. Slick. That's pretty, pretty slick, what actually. What do you do? Uh, I dressed up like a, a horrible person in gaming history and stayed home and jumped around a couple Zoom rooms to, oh. to tease some old friends, and then me and Marisha just danced and were sad yeah. we couldn't see anybody. I but, know. You know, it was, it was, was what it is. It's just it's been a strange year. It's been a strange year. I think this is just the year of strange years. My family uh -huh. are just talking about it. The year of strange years. You know what I mean. Um, my dad's birthday is the 16th, and mm. usually around that time, he's in New Orleans filming NCIS New Orleans, and his birthday usually falls like just before, just after Mardi Gras. Um, uh. When he's there this year, his birthday is Fat Tuesday. We're not gonna be in New Orleans. <sighs> he's sucks. not gonna be filming, and I am, I'm more livid than I've ever been. Like we realized it today, and I think I actually pterodactyl screeched like in the middle of my parents' bedroom, like a fucking <laughs> was that maniac. You? That was yeah, you heard it. You probably heard it. Yeah, that I was like, what was that? Like, yeah, geez. that was me. Because he was oh. like, "Did you know my birthday is Fat Tuesday this year?" I was like, <gasps> "Like, are you?" That's kidding? some bullshit. I'm we would have so been sorry. in New Orleans. I would have been blackout drunk on Bourbon Street, celebrating <laughs> my father's birthday. We would have been on floats. He could have been the marshal of some of the parades because it was his birth. Like, I'm. Curse this past year. <laughs> uh, yeah, COVID is just the kick in the ass that keeps on giving. Yeah, whenever, whenever we all get to emerge from our respective caves, uh, there is an extra level of appreciation for every single small thing. Oh, everything, oh. Matt. I'm not gonna let you go for like 20 minutes. I I'm saw okay somebody with that. make okay a joke with that. post, but I don't think they were joking. They were like, "I hope the first in-person critter hug is just like the first 10 minutes of Matt and Mika hugging each other and crying." And I'm like, "I'm not, I'm not against this at all." And yeah. that's probably exactly it. <laughs> it's so you, true. you heard it here. You heard it. I miss here. you. <laughs> I miss you. Oh. <laughs> but with a new year, hopefully, we'll start seeing some change. My Hopefully. grandma and my mom have had their first vaccinations. That's great. So that's good. My dad's gonna get his first one too soon, and then they're all gonna get their second doses. So that's great. There's a positive. There you go. Yeah. See, take it's 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 the small things, the it's small, small steps. Things. It's the small things. I know. Well, we do have a chance with this new year to also talk to some awesome people. Yes. Um, and yes. give some proper positive energy towards some other people that deserve it in this awesome space. It's true. Uh, so super excited for that. Critter Hug is that lighthouse, that beacon of, mm -hmm. of just warm, good, fuzzy feelings that even when every Wednesday is a historical event, we still have this awesome platform and space to just dedicate to pure, wholesome, good love and send out those vibes to people who really deserve it. And I feel like that's, that's my purpose on this planet is to just make sure that people who need love get love. You know? I like that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm ha happy to be right beside you getting on your coattails. Well, no, I'm on your, sir. If, if any, we're on to co coattails. Is that There you go. Co coattails? Like, co I want co, co, I want co, co coattails. Co, co, co coattails. Yeah. yeah. It's like I'm wearing half of a sleeve and then sitting on your coattail and then you're wearing the other half of the sleeve and then sitting on my coattail. There you, you go. We're probably going to trip and fall a lot, it's but you know. Coat Ouroboros, just kind <laughs> of. <laughs> I was thinking coat human centipede, but that's where my mind was what? going. I know, I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay. 2020 has destroyed me. Yeah, isn't it at all? <laughs> but to change the subject on yes. that, we do have some wonderful people. Yes, let's <laughs> let's wash the taste out. of our mouths out, just to wash that horrible taste out of our mouths mm-hmm. with our first critter hug of 2021. Dedicated to one of the busiest people in the RPG world right now, the one and only Abria Angar. That is a beautiful name for a beautiful person. And when she is not working as the CMO of Dice Envy, you can catch her on seven, you heard that correctly, seven different shows, including Pirates of Leviathan, Rhyme of the Frostmaiden on D&D's channel, Critical Bard's Creature Collector, and the list goes on until you reach seven. She also GMs Pirates of Salt Bay for Saving Throw and Heliotrope for 12-sided stories. So if you're into playful, hilarious, action-packed stories where the rule of cool is the rule of law, then you should definitely check her out. She also does a podcast called Storybenders, where she and Josh Arkin dissect and discuss every episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, arguably one of the greatest shows of our time. So yeah, uh, uh, Bri is amazing. Like, yeah. I've been following her career and rise in the live play tabletop scene for a while now, and then had the, me and Marisha both had the incredible opportunity to play alongside her in Dimension 20's Pirates yeah. of Leviathan, uh, and she's just incredible. Like, such a giving player, uh, just, completely invested, makeup on point for that character, not Always. to mention. Uh, and then, you know, also seeing all of her gemming work. She she is mm-hmm. an incredible gem that, that focuses on all the facets of storytelling that I love and ascribe to and want to be better at and have learned from watching her. Mm-hmm. Um, she's just brilliant. And I, I can't wait to see all the cool stuff that she has coming up too. Absolutely, and not only is she brilliant when it comes to GMing and playing and everything in this community, but I find it just such a a beautiful talent to just gel with anyone. Like anyone that, any room that she's in, whether it be in person or Zoom, she's everybody's best friend and in a genuine way, not in some sort of put on false way. She's just such a wholly warm person and I feel like I don't know, every time I talk to her, I feel like she's a sister that I wish I had as an only child, you know? And I, and that kind of trait in a person is just one in a million. And she's also a Time Lord, as we've discussed. Also that too, yeah, which does yeah. help, yeah. Yeah, it does, it does help. Maybe that's why she's so awesome. She, no, be. she's just awesome. Yeah, yeah. Both, yeah. Both, 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 both work together, I think. Do you think she'll let uh, us see the TARDIS? Well, let's, we'll see if we can fit it into our interview with her. <laughs> maybe, maybe if we find the time. Maybe a touchy subject, though. That's fair, I understand. You know. Yeah. We'll find out. <laughs> Bria, welcome to Critter Hub. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks yes. for having me. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you feeling? How are you doing? What's going on in your life? Oh my gosh, I'm so good. And I'm still a sort of a prisoner of hope that somehow 2021 will be different. So mm. I'm just sort of basking in that like, <laughs> is it going to be okay? I think it's going to... Mm. So, yeah, you know. definitely, definitely, right there with you. As we all kind of hold hands, going, ah, yeah, great. I'm gonna cross feed off the of threshold. Your hope. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's gonna be fine. Keep your eyes forward. Right. Just put little no horse white. blinders on. Yeah, like horses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you seem to be everywhere right now mm-hmm. in the streaming ecosystem. I feel like as I'm so lucky to see your face everywhere. It's just a blessing. But I gotta know, how did you? start you know how did you start playing rpgs how did you start dming are you a clone i need to know your secrets <laughs> uh i will start with the secret up top because we don't bury a lead here right just a lot of caffeine okay <laughs> and now let's go back um so the fun part is i started uh i started my ttrpg adventures with D as the girlfriend to my now husband's like oh board game group. And they were like, I guess you can come to um, be a cleric. Don't worry about it. And just kind of put me in the corner with like a little healer character sheet. I was like, okay. <laughs> they girl healered you. Yeah. Just immediately. <laughs> they did the same thing when I started playing Overwatch and they were like, you're a mercy maid now. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh, they handed you the cleric. That's so did. stereotypical. Yeah. I'm sorry, but that's amazing. <laughs> I, the worst part is like, I love clerics now, but I yeah. just, I rejected yeah. the idea of like, 
you're not going to understand what's happening here. So just sit in the corner. And when we need to cure wounds, like come on over. So this Mm. was like right after fifth edition, like had just come out. Mm -hmm. Um, And like this up and coming show known as critical roles on the air. Who's that? It literally was like a thing. We would like watch it on Thursdays and then try to play on Saturday, uh, trying to put together how to play uh, properly because no one had the time or attention span to read the player's handbook. (laughs) So we would just crib from things that we saw on stream dreams like i think i i think the rule worked this way i don't remember i wasn't watching the show that closely either <laughs> so it was an absolute cluster of like a game trying to get together and i think it took like two or three sessions before I was like sitting at the table. And I remember this like super clearly. And I looked around at the group and I was like, oh, I like this more than they ever will. (sighs) (laughs) And I immediately switched to a warlock, which made no sense for my character, but I had to be edgy. Like my (laughs) thought came out immediately. I was like, thoughty little tiefling, let's go. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then ran to Adventurers League, which was almost a mistake that burned me out of the game and then started DMing. (laughs) And then, uh, you know, like one friend, cause we all like kind of live in the same community with like roughly like similar friend groups. So a friend that was like spinning up a channel invited me to come on. And and then once again, I was like, I like this more than everyone else. <laughs> and basically pit myself out to any channel. And that was like, do you need a person? I'm a person. I'm a person that could do a game. I'm so available. Please let me drive. I will show up. I'll just wait at the studio until a, until a game's running and I'll just do it. <laughs> so uh, spent a very thirsty time um, and then got super busy in, in 2020. Now I'm just coasting on the like, yes, my schedule is full and I don't know where I'm supposed to be ever, but this is my, this is my best life. Perfect. Ah. I love that. Well, uh, uh, from the, the experience of coming into the game as a player, um, and I guess a lot of people have this transition. I weirdly went the other way, uh, kind of mainly being a DM first and then occasionally being a player. What was that transition like from uh, from going from playing in games and playing in streams to now running your own games live on the internet? Oh man, I was so terrified to like play on streams because I uh, once I started doing Adventures League and then I started uh, stepping into DM because when you go to your friendly local gaming store, it's the like nose goes of like no one wants to run it. Everyone just wants to like <laughs> mm-hmm. play their cool little min-max character. And I would jump in every now and then and it was a trial by fire of like getting the rules down cold. But then I started DMing uh, more frequently and for fun. Uh, I used to be a tutor. So a lot of my like tutoring students, like their incentive for good grades or like good SAT scores was like, I'll run a, I'll, like run a game for you. So then I like, I, un- I unlearned everything. So then by the time I got back into streaming, I was like, I don't know if I remember how rules work anymore. And I don't want the internet to yell at me. <sighs> mm. They did a little bit, but it was fine. They always will. They always will, no matter how hard you try, which I think is the key point of just not giving a shit. Exactly. Having fun. Oh, no. Look at, oh, they were, they were never here. Yeah. Tyler (laughs) Durden. The fucks were imaginary. (laughs) They were imaginary. Never. I love it. So now I just do it and I'm like, you can fight me in the comments. I don't really care. I can I can definitely see the tutor and the, the the teacher energy that it takes to kind of run a game with people that you haven't played before. It, it, it's a very similar skill set of like patience and care and investment in other people. That's yeah. awesome. Also wrangling drunk kittens. Exactly. Yeah. It also feels like the when you think you're being a clever DM and you're like, I'm going to drop like one clue and they'll pick it up and they'll you have to drop like 4,000 clues and they're like, I found your three clues. And you're like sitting on a pile of the other hundred that they missed. And you're like, I'm very proud of you. Yep. Listen, this is great. <laughs> we as players are stupid. <laughs> Yo, I spent plenty of time as a player and I'm like, I don't know how I get suddenly so dumb right. on the other side. I'm like, I'm only doing one thing and I'm doing it badly. <laughs> you roll out your dice and that last brain cell just goes, goodbye. Goodbye now. <laughs> I can't math. I don't know what's happening. My situational, like, situational awareness is gone. <gasps> Oh, man, you're suspicious of everyone, but you're not suspicious mm-hmm. of the villain. That's of just how it not. works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you describe the villain as hot? Well, well, I'm not to worried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I feel all of this. <laughs> oh. Well, we talked about how obviously you come from a teacher and a, and a great background and you were just so amazing and, and charismatic and boisterous and beautiful. And it's so important for GMs to have this this individual voice that you have really come into your own behind the screen. How did you come about yours? What was that journey like for you? 
Uh, I think I tried really hard. It feels like that sort of art cliche of like, first you mimic and then you find your own version of it. Mm. And I definitely started triangulating off of all of like my favorite GMs. And once again, I'm going to embarrass you, Matt. I'm so sorry. It was uh, you and like Brennan and Satine. And I just, I was like, okay, I'm going to be like them and just run these like really cool high fantasy games with like good voices. I still can't do an accent. I can't do a character voice at all. Everyone is me and they're all from like Orange County. Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I think the thing I always liked, uh, I, I, I'm not really into like high fan. Like, I've never seen all the Lord of the Rings movies. I didn't read the books. High fantasy's never been my thing. So I, I feel like at some point I realized I couldn't emulate my favorites because I didn't have the same like sort of like shared background and uh, like reference set. So it then just sort of became a, like the thing I like is comedy and like sci-fi mo- like, and movies. So all of that became informed by the things that I care about. And because uh, I absolutely believe this thing, uh, Patrick Roth that said forever ago <clears throat> about like the thing that you care about, if you lean into it, your enthusiasm will kind of like rub off on your audience. So I was like, I just started leaning into like being a little more improv and just saying like, Rule of Cool says yes. Like if it works in a Kevin Hart, uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson movie that like suspends all physics disbelief, like mm-hmm. why can't you do that too? Right. And just sort of hand waving it and hoping we get to a good story at the end and just sort of trusting totally. the table. Well, you you hide yourself when you mention about not having that stuff, but I think it's I think it's a strength too because yeah. while a lot of us came into fantasy through a lot of these these you know films or television series or books, uh, that is a great reference point. But it's also often something we have to be careful to not continue to tread the same tropes mm-hmm. or fall into telling the same kind of stories. Coming in from your perspective of not having that in some cases inspiration, in some cases baggage, you get to create something that is wholly unique in that same space. So I I think it's I think it's fantastic. I think Absolutely. it's it's a strength more than anything. And it sounds oh. like we're gonna do a Fast and the Furious RPG together. Um, I wrote a hack for, uh, <laughs> it's a it's a Powered by the Apocalypse game that's Fast and Furious 2099. So you're playing the 99th movie in the franchise yes! with a bunch of tropes. <laughs> yes! I will run it for you whenever you want. Please. I ran it once on a stream. It immediately went off the rails. It was like a Transformers movie and a My Little Pony movie. I think there was a kaiju there. It was wild. Yes, please. Me, yeah. Familia, we'll let's do this. Do it. Yeah, it was, it's about family. <laughs> it's and then you get like family. bonuses whenever you can like work that into a monologue. It's just, yeah, yeah. Hold, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah. Hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, j- just to jump in, and we won't take too much time on this, just because my, <laughs> my my personal interest in it. Uh, you also have a podcast called Storybenders, where you recap Avatar: The Last Airbender, which is one of my favorite animated series of all time. Big uh, ditto. How did that how did that come about? And uh, also, why is it the best show ever? Oh yeah. my gosh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was definitely like I watch a lot of uh, film, like film, like essays on YouTube, and after a while, I was just like, okay, a lot of these are on like sort of conventionally understood to be the best films in the game and I was like wait a second the thing I like I I love anime and I love animation in general and I feel like it never gets a good enough rap I was like watching uh, Prince of Egypt last night and just like open mouth crying like this is just good (laughs) cinema and I don't know why Dreamworks didn't explode after this (laughs) but I, I, I agree I think Avatar is maybe like it's one of the best series period yeah that's mm-hmm. ever been made like yeah. it handles this sort of like Campbellian monomyth in the or in a really way like a really nice way that like engages young viewers but like every episode has like <clears throat> a really sort of clarion idea that it wants to get and it's usually like a theme or a device and I uh was sitting with my friend Josh who watched it for the first time uh deep in the depression of uh you know panty depression and I was like mm, all right come here my little quarantine friend like watch this thing and we just got like very full of wine and screaming about like all of the like <laughs> high level, like all the very cool, like high level uh, writer's devices that were in this show. And we're like, what if we tried to do like a, like a film essay, but for a, for a children's show. And then it just became this like fun exercise. And I love this podcast so much and it never comes out fast enough because kind of busy. Right. But <laughs> Yeah, but I'm so excited to go through all of it and then go deep into Korra because I love Korra a bunch and I'm going to fight B. Dave Walters to the death over. Oh, I'm on your team. I'm I'm here to back you up. Thank you. 
Thank you. We'll take him. I'm not we'll scared. Him. I'm not scared of him. I'll get his knees and then you go for the head. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. this is I'll teamwork. go for the torso then. There's, he's a tall guy. There's a he's lot a tall go guy. For. We need three people. There's so <laughs> much room for all of us to go. Yeah, all of us get in a trench coat and we got <laughs> B-Day got versus B-Dave. It's great. But quick follow-up question for this. What element would you bend? Oh my gosh. Know. I feel so bad. I would love to be a firebender. Yeah, no, I know it's dope. it's no. so good. It's like slither. It's misunderstood, you know? You're not just evil if you're a firebender. Thank like you. fire is powerful and also beautiful, just like you. Oh my god. That's awesome. And, I, I I lean earth bending because it's easier to build stuff with. I'm a water bender. I'm a moon child. Nice. I respect that. We're and none team. of us are airbenders. Because <laughs> I don't know. The outfits aren't as fun. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's yeah. true. Although they are roomy. I could use that in the valley. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, to wrap all of this up, where can folks at home follow you and all of your awesome seven shows and podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the easiest way to follow me is uh, on social media at Quiddy, Q-U-I-D-D-I-E, which is definitely a Harry Potter reference because <laughs> I, I'm... I like, I like the sport, the nerd sport. Um, and yeah, you can follow my schedule there and there's like cool stuff coming up and I never remember to like talk about it all but if you follow on socials it's all there <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us thank you were just you. Thank you a so delight you're just a ball of light and i want to siphon your joy like a lich queen and just keep it for myself <laughs> i have enough for you it thank is you. freely given um, nom, 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 nom. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much we'll talk to you soon thank you bye, bye. Fair warning, some mild spoilers are ahead for an NPC that's introduced in episode 114 of Critical Role Campaign 2. So if you're not caught up, hit the mute button when you see this graphic. Now, for those who are caught up, you may recall that Dag and Underthorn, the grizzled badass explorer in the frozen wastes of Isilcross, uses a wheelchair. Now that specific wheelchair and the mechanics behind it were not created by me, they were created by the recipient of our next Critter Hug. Sarah Thompson, AKA Mustangs Art on Twitter, is an amazing GM and advocate for disabled representation in RPGs. Using feedback from D&D players who use wheelchairs, Sarah crafted the Combat Wheelchair for 5th Edition, a versatile and flavorful homebrew that works with disabilities in a positive way, rather than focusing on limitations and penalties. It allows disabled characters to go upstairs, carry their equipment, add weapons and upgrades, traverse difficult terrain, and just so much more even beyond that. Sarah also created a new character background, the Paralympian, as well as new subclasses for monks and blood hunters, which I'm super honored by, that incorporate the combat wheelchair in meaningful and empowering ways. Sarah is also the founding member of Heroes Without Limits, a Twitch stream dedicated to disabled, chronically ill, and neurodivergent representation in RPGs. So go check them out. Sarah and her team are doing really amazing and important work. Also, check out her Patreon. The Combat Wheelchair is online and free to use. It's linked in the description below. And you can purchase character minis with the Combat Wheelchair through Strata Miniatures, who donate a percentage of their sales to Eller Stanlow Support UK. I'm kind of in awe of the Combat Wheelchair and how intricate it is. I mean, it's one thing to add a homebrew element at all, and I know how complicated homebrew elements are just by watching my DMs oh, yeah. do them. Oh, yeah. and just the amount of layered work. I feel like anytime I see somebody asking her a question about it, there's like 15 paragraphs answering that question because she already mm -hmm. thought about it. Yep. Um, it's just, it's it's mind blowing amount of work that went into this and you can tell that her entire heart and soul and passion went into it, which makes it even better. It's just, it's, it's awesome. And I can't believe it's taken this long for a combat wheelchair to exist in game like this. It's just yeah. something that's, I don't know. I'm just I'm, at least I'm happy that it's happening now. Yeah, it's 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 another step towards making things just generally better when it comes to RPGs. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, knowing how challenging homebrew is, especially on on the scale of complexity mm -hmm. and options that are presented with this, uh, that is no easy feat. And uh, I know that Sarah put a lot of time into developing this and fine tuning it and getting feedback, and it's it's badass. I'm I'm I. I I you know, went and bought and painted a mini. I incorporated my game. I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm so excited that I had the opportunity to to bring it in there and and brought just that much more flavor to the character. Um, and I mean, you get to have spider legs if you want to. You get to have spider which legs, which I think is amazing. Which All is awesome. Upgrades are badass. Yeah, and also the Heroes Without Limits campaigns 
are so important to everyone out there. I, I know especially to people who think that they have to hide their disabilities or their illnesses or their neurodivergencies because of professionalism. You know, um, I've been told many times in my life not to talk about bipolar depression because then I might not get a job, which is insane. Yeah. But the fact that there's a whole Twitch and campaigns in multiple different games dedicated to celebrating characters with these neurodivergencies and illnesses and chronic pains and just they're living their lives adventuring rather than having it feel like a scarlet letter. It's just it's it's awesome. I just love that we are making strides these days, you know? Yeah. And it's people like Sarah that are continuing to push that call and Absolutely. rally and, and normalize it and just show that these games are for everybody to create however they want to and play however they want to. And it's just, it's badass. Yes. Yeah. And we got to talk to Sarah about we did. it. We which did. We are just so honored. So let's take a look at that. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us in this episode of Critter Hug. <laughs> Yay. No, yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Um, yeah, it's really cool, actually. So <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, super honored to have you here. How has everything been going lately? How are you doing in quarantine? <laughs> um, quarantine sucks. Yeah. Um, you know, with all the UK, we're now on like tier five of a three tier lockdown, however that works. Um, so there's that going on. Um uh, but yeah, no, it's it's just been making TTRPG stuff, so I don't, at least I don't need to leave my home for that. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there you go. The adaptation. So <laughs> uh, well, here uh, let's dive into talking about some of your amazing work that you've done recently. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess from from your uh, design standpoint, how did the combat wheelchair come to be? Like, what was the design process like, and the kind of the the impetus of the inspiration to go ahead and put this together? Um. It was during a D&D game and I made an offhand comment um, with some of my friends because we were all disabled and playing. And mm. I was like, imagine if you could just have like a wheelchair and like use the murder ball kind of tactics and apply it to D&D because I certainly wouldn't want somebody ramming into me with a wheelchair at high speed, especially if they had a <laughs> weapon or weaponized magic on them. Um, and my friends were like, oh no, you should definitely do that. That would be really cool. Um, and... Yeah, I then, because um, I was doing my uh, university degree at the time, um, I was in my final year at uni when I started making it. So uh, I actually went to the university library and like took out resource books and everything on um, on like uh, wheelchair sports, uh, disability studies. Like I went into that section and just started taking it out, even though I was doing English language and literature. So, like, <laughs> the, the librarians were kind of like, what are you doing um, in this section? But um, yeah, so... I kind of got, uh, you know, a whole bunch of resources together and was watching videos and uh, there's a documentary called Murderball, which is really cool. Um, and like, I was like, okay, now how can I apply that concept to the fifth edition rule set? Mm -hmm. um, and to begin with, it was very much like bare bones, like three actions that you could do and uh, some some thought put into how you would stay in the chair and things like that. Um, and then I was like, no, it needs to kind of be a bit more uh, in depth because there's so many possibilities in Dungeons and Dragons of things that can happen. Um, and especially as I kind of grew a bit more confident with the fifth edition rule set, like knowing what to expect from players, mm -hmm. um, like what to look out for. So uh, it was then I had to think about um applying like uh the stats of like a real murder ball chair which um they actually have five wheels so they have two on the side two at the front and a stabilizer at the back to prevent mm. tipping backwards so then i was like okay then they would have advantage against being pushed prone because you can get up very easily the stabilizer also prevents that unless you're hit at a very high speed um and yeah like it was all you know i, I literally had like had printed out like murder ball stuff and like <laughs> pictures of wheelchairs and I was like okay what can I apply to where um and yeah like it was how to you know how how to um manage chairs and different environments um it was very extensive uh and even now it's like I'm still touching things up I'm currently you know making the the rule set as kind of streamlined and neat as possible um because I'm going to bring out a new pdf with all the new updated rules and and like it's gonna have you know nice artwork and things in um and <laughs> some you. subclasses 
Um, so Ooh. yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's all shaping up to be pretty good. But yeah, it took about a year design wise uh, to get to where it is, well, where it was when I published it in August. Um, yeah, so yeah, it was it was a long process and getting disabled friends who use wheelchairs to um, basically be the play testers. I, I kind of took um, feedback from disabled people and prioritized that um, more over just general feedback because I was trying to capture their experience and that's what mattered to me. Um, yeah, so it was you know, r- just a really long process of like, okay, no, this doesn't work. Try again. No, this doesn't work. Try mm-hmm. again. And then it was like, okay, that that's right. But like, it doesn't reflect this like kind of um, vibe of what the chair can do. So it's like, take it back to the drawing board and try again <laughs> um, until, yeah, I had something that um, my friends who use wheelchairs were able to turn around and say, yeah, that's what my experience is like. And I would love to play a character using this. So yeah, it was just a very long process. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. It's it's been more than rewarding um, in terms of like seeing my friends use it and be happy using it that mm-hmm. they get to play someone like them. And uh, you kind of touched on it earlier that there are so many pieces and and parts to it, and you did a lot of research. And the wheelchair has a lot of badass upgrades. So I got to know what was your favorite to develop or your favorite to implement. Um, my favorite is actually the spider legs one. It's my favorite too. It's It's my favorite. (laughs) So (laughs) cool. Um, Which requires the 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 soul forged uh, engine underneath it, Um, and that came from (laughs) that came from watching an episode of Clone Wars when Darth Maul comes back and he has the spider Mm -hmm. legs. Because yes. that was really cool. Um, and I was watching Clone Wars while I was updating the, the combat wheelchair. And I was like, oh, that would be really cool if the chair could like get legs and like climb up walls and certain surfaces. Um, yeah, so that one's my definitely like my favorite upgrade. <laughs> I love it. That's so awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> now, <clears throat> like you said, this was an extensive design process for, process for you to go ahead and, and build this within uh fifth edition rules uh but you went through the proper process of doing real life research and asking for actual gamers experience uh in that space uh i guess at this point now especially after all that what advice or guidance do you have for folks out there players or dms that want to incorporate the combat wheelchair into their game uh in the way that you were hoping they would um yeah uh well at the beginning of the pdf that's kind of like a, a rundown on disability in in gaming. Um, But there are also lots of extensive um, resources that you can make use of um, that are free. Um, If you check out uh, on Twitter, Jennifer Kretschmer at DreamWisp, um, Mm. they have made uh, in their pinned tweet, like an extensive um, like collection of anything that like a a DM, a GM uh, player, or even people who want to design um disability items like anything that they could basically ask for it's like there and uh you know it's like most of it is free I think there are a few things you have to pay for um but yeah I think a lot of people don't realize that um research uh you you know you have the whole of the internet at your fingertips but people aren't sure when it comes to disability what to kind of research but there are a lot of disabled people out there who write blogs or make videos um, and run sites and forums um, where like you can ask questions and get answers or you can always just scan through. Um, there are plenty of people on Twitter as well who are disability consultants like me um, that if you're looking for a specific experience um, that you could reach out to them, you know, tip them on Kofi or something, usually just for like asking a few questions because, you know, it does take up time and emotional labor and, and all of that. Um, but yeah, people usually are more than happy to answer questions, um, and make, make the most of, uh, internet research really, Mm -hmm. um, especially YouTube. Um, there are a lot of, uh, cool things on YouTube. Um, if you aren't sure, like how the combat wheelchair is designed to move, I check out, I check out, um, Aaron Botherinkham, uh, who is a WCMXer, uh, which is like, uh, BMXing, but in a wheelchair, um and you know he he uh got a he recently um he recently achieved like a doing a flip in a wheelchair from like it being still um, that's awesome so what? that was really cool uh he yeah he does a lot of like half pipe uh tricks and things and that's kind of where 
um, especially like when I was designing my rogue character, that was like, that's how I want my rogue to move mm -hmm. is like that. Um, so definitely like check out um, sports, wheelchair sports, um, because there are so many of them that people just don't know about. Like people didn't know about wheelchair fencing. Um, when I brought up a character who uses a rapier and is also in a wheelchair and people were like, well, how does that work? And I was like, there is such a thing as wheelchair fencing. <laughs> Link. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look it up. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of cool um, things out there. And especially, you know, people tend to forget as well the Paralympics. Like that's a whole thing you can mm. make use of and see how people, professionals, you know, can can move in their wheelchairs and the kind of feats that they can accomplish doing it. You actually created the Paralympian background, uh, right? And also a monk and a blood hunter subclass. Can you touch a little bit more on that? Can you give us a little spoilers? Any plans to make more of those? Um, yeah, I've currently got out so far a barbarian blood hunter. Um, there is a warlock, a rogue, paladin class. My goodness. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the... I think there are a couple more I cannot remember off the top of my head. There's a bard. Wait, there's a bard. And basically you cut out your wheelchair with musical instruments to become like a one-man band. Yes. Um, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so, um, and the good thing about those subclasses is it states that they are used, that they have been written for the combat wheelchair, but they're written in a way that even if you had a character who didn't use a wheelchair or only used them uh, like ambulatory, so only sometimes um, you can still make full use of that class and its features and uh, everything like you aren't uh, you don't have to use the chair um, if you don't want to um, like an example is uh, the blood hunter class um, basically anyone who's playing a character with chronic pain and chronic fatigue could play that class they don't need to have the combat wheelchair in order to do it um, yeah and I've got like a few more of those planned to come out. I mean, there's a sorcerer that's going to be coming out in February. Ooh. I've done. Ooh. Um, You've piqued my interest. <laughs> spoiler, spoiler, it involves um, blood magic. So it's going to be <laughs> You've triply piqued my interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I'm looking forward to that most definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I want to also mention you are the founding member of the Twitch channel Heroes Without Limits. Uh, if you could tell our viewers a little bit about that and kind of what that experience has been for you. Um, yeah, Heroes Without Limits was something I started in second year of my university, I think. Yeah, second year. Um, and basically it is um, a channel and a community um, comprised of disabled, chronically ill, neurodivergent folks making uh, content um, for those folks. Um, so all of our cast are either disabled, chronically ill, neurodivergent, um, and they play characters who are like them. Um, and they explore stories and worlds um, and things like that. Um, like we have a Witcher game that I run uh, once every mm -hmm. other month on there. And um, we have witches that have uh, ADHD um, and they you know, meet NPCs who are like uh, witches that are deaf or blind and using, using um, rules and things that like I'd made for that specifically. Um, and our community, we have a Discord now, so people can join there. There's a whole, like, let's find games um, area, so other disabled, chronically ill, neurodivergent mm -hmm. folks can find people like them to play with um, and kind of, you know, connect with. Um, and uh, it's open as well to able-bodied people, like, with, you know, completely, like, able-bodied people, neurotypical people are more than welcome. Um, and we even have, like, a little area on the Discord where um, able body people can can actually ask questions and uh you know people can respond with their own experiences if they want to um so it's like a kind of um place that aims to educate and just like bring people kind of together and find other people to connect with because I know that when I kind of got more into the TTRPG community I very rarely met anyone who had like my disability but now I know like six other people now <laughs> that uh, I've kind of got into it more um so yeah it's a place where you know younger and older people in the community can just find each other and connect and have a good time that's awesome yeah and last but not least where can everybody watching this episode today find and follow your work um, I pretty much do everything on Twitter. Um, so um, on my Twitter, which is at Mustangs Art. Um, sometimes I also stream on Twitch talking about like 
NPC design and things. I have a plan for um, running uh, like little classes and seminars at some point on Ooh. teaching about disability for DMs and for players and GMs. Um, and uh, my Twitch is also just under the same name, Mustangs Art. Everything pretty much that I'm on, it's under Mustangs Art. Um, so yeah, pretty much is it's just uh, Twitter that I'm predominantly on um and i have stuff on patreon i also have free stuff that people can use and uh i have kofi and everything else is uh pretty much linked through my my uh tw- twitch my my twitter sorry <laughs> awesome i love it well everyone please go check out sarah's work sarah thank you so much for joining us and thank you for all the incredible creativity and design and delight that you bring to this community it's really appreciated Absolutely. thank you so much no thank thank you for having me on it was really lovely talking about it so thank you yeah. <laughs> and thank you and thank you for using the chair in in the game as well of um, course Dagon uh, has not just meant a lot to me, but like to other people in the community as well. People being very excited and saying there's a character like me in Critical Role mm. was very sweet and very nice to see. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, I, I, I've been, I had the character design for a while and it was it was just this perfect kismet that when they were getting to that part of the story, you released the rules for it and it was like, this is, this is fucking perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! So thank you. The timing Thanks. was, timing was absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> universe wanted it to happen. Yeah. Thank you, universe. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, we got an incoming critter hug for Jiangxi Blood in the Banquet Hall. It is a heartwarming RPG slash board game set in the 1920s where players play a family of Chinese immigrants running a restaurant. You manage day-to-day operations of the restaurant, navigate family drama, and grapple with the realities of being an immigrant in America during the 20s. There's also vampires. Did I mention the vampires? Because there's vampires. That's like a huge part of the game. Damn right. (laughs) Right? (laughs) At night, the players are stalked by Jiangxi, or hopping vampires from Chinese folklore. The players must band together as a family to fend off racism, gangs, and literal bloodthirsty monsters. That's a lot going on. Also, you have to clean dishes, and cleaning dishes sucks. Game designers Banana Chan and Sin Foon Lim heavily drew upon their heritages as Chinese American Canadians. For example, eight is a lucky number in Chinese culture, so the game uses D8s. And the number four is traditionally an unlucky number, so in Jiangxi, when players roll a four, it cancels out the highest number in the roll. It's little details like that that make Jiangxi Blood in the Banquet Hall uniquely heartfelt and horrifying, while also encouraging empathy and education through role playing. The PDF print and play version is available now on DriveThruRPG, and the full box is available for pre-order right now. Like, right now. So Currently. Good. So go get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan of the... I mean, cultural education is such an important thing, mm-hmm. and there are very few facets, I find, that can really kind of help bridge that, that empathic uh, gap in games can. And... I love the idea of, of games inviting people to come in and, and participate in culture, uh, but they have to be and have not classically been developed always from a, a respectful place mm. or from a person who, who actually comes from that culture. And I, so more and more people that have the opportunity to create games to celebrate their heritage and to, to invite other people to come and participate in it is awesome. And then you also add uh, Jiangxi, add the vampires to it, which uh, I, I learned about Jiangxi, when I was heavy into Darkstalkers growing up, yes! the, the Capcom <laughs> game with Xianko. And so learning about that history and, you know, though that was just a game character and, and a very specific type of thing that, that got me in the rabbit hole of, of learning about them and their mythology and their history. So I was super excited to see that incorporated into this RPG as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's something really special about taking something that we see a lot in media like vampires and putting the cultural spin on it. You know, every mm-hmm. culture has their own take on mythology throughout the ages and you know a mermaid is different in scottish culture and african culture so seeing that darkness what those dark streets of 1920s look from from the chinese culture rather than just the you know it's it's really it's so fascinating and i think that this is again we keep talking about like this is the new age you know we're really starting to do things i'm so excited to see more stories told like this so we get to experience everybody's bump in the nights you know heck yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) um we also were lucky enough to get to talk to these creators of jiangxi blood of the banquet hall so uh let's let's take a little look-see 
Banana Chan and Sen Lin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so, so much for having us. us. Yeah, thanks for having us here. Yeah, no worries. Uh, first off, I guess we'll jump right in with uh, this amazing game, Jian Shi. It is incredibly unique. Uh, it's, it's just a generally very special game, and I want to know what kind of went into the creating and development of it for both of you. What was the kind of the, the, the real initial interest point that blossomed the rest of the project? I think it's a combination of things. I think uh, Sen and I had been work wanting to work together for a while. Uh, and then eventually we started off with making this Google doc. That's just like this massive living document uh, where we just threw all of our ideas onto it. And uh, we decided, hey, why don't we do something that's based around our culture? Uh, something that we're you know close with. Uh, so we came up with this idea and we wanted to use uh, Jiao Bei initially, Moonblocks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Sen, you could talk about it more if you want. It, it's our, our, it's petty jealousy, is what it is. Uh, <laughs> we have a bunch of friends who make some really cool games, and uh, they did like Dread and Starcrossed and games that use a Jenga tower and just alternate ways of randomizing things and having outcome generation. And we thought, oh, let's do something cultural and let's let's bring you know our our culture into it. And we tried, but they're really expensive and it's kind of messing with religion. So we thought, eh, let's put it aside. And we went with just dice, just you know, just dice. Um, so it started with that though. It did start with a whole cultural bent, which, as you can tell, you know, Banana and I are both Chinese. So we thought uh, we'd seen a spate of games being made about Asia by non-Asian people, and we thought you know, we can, we can do this one better, you know, actually have some Asian-ness in there. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's actually really remarkable. I was actually just talking to a bunch of people who are making a game about Japan and like almost none of the, the core, well, none of the core team are Japanese. Uh, and it was just fascinating to me that they took so long to think about culture and, uh, you know, have cultural consultants and, Banana and I are both Chinese, and the first people we hired, I think, were cultural consultants about our own culture. Right. Uh, because mm -hmm. we realized that, you know, you know, we're not a monolith. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm from Southeast Asia, actually, and Banana's family is uh, Hong Kong and Guangdong. And so we have very different ideas of what being Chinese is. Uh, and so we thought we'd write a game about that from an immigrant's perspective because both of our families immigrated to Canada and then Banana went to the States. So mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to really explore that area of our history. So it was really a little bit of soul searching as well as, hey, let's make a fun game out of it all. And let's, let's help people explore our past and culture like we did through the research through a game. And, and uh, the vampires were added as the kind of big bad in a way that was really representative of like oppression and racism at the time. Mm -hmm. So the story of Zhang Shi really takes place a little bit after the gold rush uh, at a time when perhaps, you know, all those Chinese people who immigrated to Canada and the States on the West coast were no longer really needed there or wanted there. The, the rail had been finished. Uh, the gold rush is done. Um, you know, there was some horrific stuff that happened during the gold rush because, you know, they're coming to take our gold. Um, well, I would be coming to take your gold, I guess. I don't know <laughs> how to phrase that. Um, but uh, we put placed it a little bit after that uh, just because it was also a really interesting time. Uh, the Roaring Twenties, um, just the idea that there was possibility mm, yeah. for change. And so we really focused around family as well. That's That was a big deal for us. Maybe, Banana, you want to talk about family? Yeah, so the game, uh, you have three generations, right? So you have your parent, your grandparent, and the child characters uh, that you're playing from. And I guess when you're playing, there are going to be like language barriers because not everyone, even though, you know, it's a Chinese family, not everyone uh, has the same level of understanding with the dialects or uh, with English. So older generations might not know English as well and younger generations will know uh, English, but maybe not the dialect as well. So it's interesting, like seeing players, how they interpret that uh, and how they play it out. And there are also different hopes and dreams for each character as well, so that it's not 
uh, necessarily tied to just like one thing, right? This character is three-dimensional. They have different hopes and dreams. They have different hobbies. They have different interests, uh, making them more, you know, not as uh, two-dimensional as you would uh, probably see in some other types of media. I love that. I I think role-playing games in particular, thoughtfully designed role-playing games have a really, really wonderful way of of sharing culture in ways that other media doesn't have the opportunity to. I really love what you guys have done with this game. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And And speaking of sharing culture, you guys have woven so much Chinese folklore and historical significance into the narrative and the mechanics even of this game. So I want to know from both of you, what are some of your favorite elements? Um, my favorite element, uh, that's historical is really just the history. Like in, in digging deep into it, I found out, you know, a lot about myself, Mm -hmm. a lot about my ancestors, Mm -hmm. a lot about, uh, just even simple things like respect for Americanized Chinese food. Right. (laughs) No, it's, it's this, it's this thing where a lot of people who come over from Hong Kong or wherever, they look at the Americanized Chinese food and they're like, whoa, that's not Chinese food. And it really isn't. Mm-hmm. Let's face it, it's not. And they yeah. they <laughs> they kind of thumb their nose at it. They're like, oh, this, this is not me. This is not my culture. And I agree, it is not. However, what it is to me, it's a sign of perseverance. It's a sign of survival. These are people who beyond all odds survived and scraped together a living in a an actually really hard field. Restauranting. Restaurant, is that a word? I don't know. But it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> Restaurant. Whatever it is, it's difficult. I don't yeah. I do it, right? It's it's <laughs> difficult to do and say, apparently. And so I don't uh I don't view that like that anymore. And I kind of probably did before I started, but doing the research on restauranting, restaurant touring, I don't know. I don't and know. <laughs> uh, Americanized Chinese food really actually changed how I viewed that. And mm. it was just by doing a lot of reading and listening to people and um, lots of stories from friends who run restaurants, whose families are restaurant families, because my family isn't a restaurant family. And uh, it was it's really uh, interesting to hear about the history of it, like how families just, they aren't restaurant families. They will go and buy a restaurant because it's literally the only way they can immigrate into Canada. They'll just buy one uh, and learn how to run it in the like, 10 days before the person who owned it before them wants to retire. Mm. Uh, just stories like that are amazing to me that you'll just up and move your family literally halfway around the world on a hope and a prayer and, you know, $20,000 worth of restaurant. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's really incredible. Yeah. I think going off of that, like, just hearing people talk about their experiences uh, running restaurants or, you know, their family running restaurants, it really shines a light on like what it's, um, what it's like and what it takes for like immigrant families to build up a business, uh, which is really inspiring. Um, On a related note, I guess, like, I learned a lot about Taoism, (laughs) like divination tools. Uh, So I spent a long time uh, researching uh, Fulu, which are uh, these paper spells. You've probably seen them in um, a lot of like esoteric uh, Asian cultures where they do, uh, where they write like spells on pieces of paper. And that's like a blessing that you can put onto like a uh, a location or an mm-hmm. object or something like that. And or, so we sort of, or a vampire's head. I better say, yeah. And, and, yeah. Head. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we wrote that into uh, the game itself as well, where it's like a sort of like this mechanic where you write uh, something that keeps the family together mm-hmm. uh, and keeps them, you know, uh, sort of surviving together on this sheet of paper. And if it works, then the juncture are dispelled and everyone goes home happy. So, <laughs> Uh, that's so cool. I that's awesome. It. Um, now, f- you've in creating this game and, and, and putting it out there, people are going to be grabbing this and wanting to dive in, um, whether they are from a similar or very different background culture. Uh, what advice do you guys have for players and GMs that are interested in running a game of Jiangxi uh, to really kind of get them started, immersed, and ready to run this confidently? Uh, I think the biggest thing is to read the sections that... Uh, uh, James Mendes Hodes wrote. Um, it's 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 really weird that we actually had to write this, but we wrote a section on how to be racist, uh, and that sounds really strange coming from a bunch of people of color. But it's how to be how to set the tone where we know racism happens and racism racism is a legitimate force in that area, that world, 
without actually being racist, right? And mm -hmm. because we hope a lot of people who play aren't actual racists, uh, but you have to play in the tone of it to set the players up for the game, right? Because like I said before, the as anybody who's who's been an active um, anti-racist knows it's tiring work. And literally that is what exactly happens with Chinese vampires. They don't suck your blood. They suck your life force. They, mm -hmm. they make you tired and like paralyze you. And, and so that was sort of the analogy between racism and oppression and also then vampires. And so the section that is about that, I think is really important. Um, the section about how to play as a person of color when you're not a person of color uh, is also very important or when you're not of that culture even, right? Mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you're of color, but if you're not Chinese, you might feel a little trepidatious walking around in a Chinese person's shoes, even for gaming purposes. Um, and so, you know, there's just some rules of, you know, what to do and what not to do. Like, don't use accents, right? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. simple. Um, and there's also other rules like, you know, don't hyper-focus on the one thing that you know about Chinese people all the time. Just kind of be yourself. Um, so, while still playing a role. So there's all that kind of stuff. What do you think, Banana? Yeah, I think uh, going off of what you were saying, also just teaching people about microaggressions. Um, so the section you were talking about, like how to play a racist NPC, uh, it sort of outlines like, you know, what may microaggressions look like um, so that the players sort of understand uh, what it looks like. And also like, you know, if they have gone through microaggressions themselves, it could be like a cathartic experience where it's just like, oh, I recognize this. You know, this is something that has happened in my life. Now I know what to do when, you know, I approach a situation again in the future or something like that. Um, also in terms of playing a Chinese character, uh, there's this whole section on like not trying too hard and just attaching yourself to like, you know, the hopes and dreams that the character has, the hobbies that they have, the things that make them them, uh, and just not trying too hard to be like, uh, what was the, I think Menda said this, like it was like a martial arts weirdo or something like that. <laughs> yeah, don't be that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> well, Thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, where can everybody who is watching today follow you and whatever future projects that you guys have coming up? If you maybe want to tease a little bit of a future project mm -hmm. that you have coming up. Go ahead, Banana. I could go. Okay, I could go first. <laughs> you can totally go. Um, yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Banana Chan Games. Uh, Sen and I are working on three different games together. I Ooh. think uh, we have one of which we can sort of talk about, maybe? Yeah, sure. Just yeah, one night <laughs> only. Taste. Yeah. yeah. So we're making a rock band game <laughs> together uh, where uh, you're playing kids uh, in their senior year and you have a rock band together. And then we fast forward to um, you as adults having to reunite the band. So. Yeah, that's you're cool. you're at a so at a high cool. school reunion type thing, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah no. That's that's our that's our next. That's our next role-playing game together. Um, but Anna, is there anything that's coming out through Game of the Curry for board games? Um, I don't think so. Oh, I am doing something with Austin Knight. Um, Austin Knight and I are making a tabletop role-playing game in a, uh, a coloring book. Um, and it's oh, about cool. a boarding school. So it's sort of similar where it's like your adults returning back to uh, you know this boarding school and you're trying to collect memories and it's like a creepy Stephen King vibey Ooh. type of game. So. I was about to say with a boarding school, the, the yeah. theme tends to go a little yeah. darker. Yeah. I have a few friends I know who will be able to dive into that from personal experience. Boarding schools are never normal. <laughs> no. no. They're very strange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the only other thing that I'm working on is uh, Kingdom Rush 2. So Kingdom mm. Rush 2, it's a board game. Uh, we did Kingdom Rush 1 like two years ago and it made over a million dollars on Kickstarter. So we thought we'd do Kingdom Rush 2. Why not? Yeah. So that, that should be on GameFound actually, not on Kickstarter this year. So. And where can we find you on socials? Oh, you can find me at Sen Fung Lim, S E N F O O N G L I M. Wonderful. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for making you. such incredible work. And we look forward to seeing all the awesome stuff that you could and could not talk about coming out in your future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks you for guys. having us. Thanks for Bye. having us. Bye. <laughs> Our first Critter Flag salute of 2021 goes out to Paula's Pixels. 
a fabulous one-stop online shop packed to the brim with colorful D&D-themed apparel and more. And Paola Harris, the store's owner, started creating and selling her designs as a side hustle, but she recently quit her full-time job to focus entirely on growing her adorable and chic brand of geeky merch. She also has a Patreon where her patrons get access to wallpapers, stickers, tutorials, and even a vote on what designs they want to see Paola crank out next. I personally am obsessed with all of Paola's designs. I mean, <laughs> I have an actual problem. If you go through my Etsy purchases, that there's so many. My t-shirt stack has just like a Paola section. I just, there's something about the minimalistic, subtle yet geeky vibe that she does that's just it speaks to me on a wholesome like a deep deep level especially because i used to be that kid that wore like a pikachu on the shirt mm -hmm. but as i matured into an adult you know i do this i'm wearing a vampire diaries necklace and ring but you wouldn't know unless you, you went deep vampire. into vampire diaries I, I, you fell hard i fell really hard matt that is another <laughs> discussion for another day it's such Fair a problem enough. we don't even want to get into it right now no worries. but you would you wouldn't know you know unless you yeah. know and I think that's, that that's what's so great about Paula is like you don't know unless you know. Yeah, that's you well, that's, that's my favorite whole aesthetic for for clothing, and I'm I'm I can barely dress myself as it is. <laughs> um, so it's nice to find clothing that I can feel comfortable, you know, looking good, but also be expressive of my menagerie of geeky hobbies. Um, and it's funny because like I'd seen so many of Paula's designs at conventions and mm -hmm. through friends, you know, and 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 always thought those are really cool. Where did they come from? And and it wasn't until uh, we started getting prepared for this episode that I actually went and through her site and was like, oh shit, I've seen all of these designs for so long and now I know where they come from. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, that that this critter hug was for me as well. Yeah, <laughs> and we actually got to talk to her, which is kind of like talking to royalty in the, in the geek world. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's check it out. Indeed. Paula, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. No, I'm happy to have you. Uh, so we, I myself am curious, but also our audience, um, how, when exactly did you start and get the idea for Paolo's Pixels? Like when did this begin and, and how did it all sort of come about for you? I think uh, it was when I started listening to d d podcast, especially mm -hmm. like the Adventure Zone. Oh yeah. Definitely the ones that, <laughs> <laughs> that started my love and they started like all the other podcasts, you know, one by one. Mm -hmm. But I remember they started re they released pins of uh for the adventure zone and I thought that's cool. Like <laughs> I wonder if I could design something like that because um I've always been a designer. I used to work at a t-shirt company. So I just saw t-shirts all day and screen printing is a lot like designing pins because you have to do it like very flat. So I thought it would, what I used to do would be perfect for pins and that's just kind of how it started. And then I started like designing t-shirts and pins and just grew and grew. And now it's this. <laughs> yeah, now it's a thing. Yeah. That's now amazing. Now it's a huge thing. <laughs> and speaking of your old job, you used to live this fabulous Hannah Montana double life, having a full-time job and also running your store. So what was going through your head when you decided, no more Hannah Montana, I'm Miley Cyrus only, or Hannah Montana only, whichever you prefer, and you did Paolo's Pixels full-time? I think I was just going a little too hard. <laughs> you know, it, it <laughs> felt like, like I had two jobs because I was working full time all day and then mm -hmm. at night after my daughter went to sleep I would work again you know like for my store mm -hmm. so I felt like I had no time to do anything fun it was just like work and then work again and I really felt like I couldn't like I couldn't even touch a video game you know? <laughs> so I decided for my sanity that I had to to jump into this and see how it went and so far, so good. <laughs> That's the way to do it. You, know, yeah. you never you never know if it'll work until you try. And if it doesn't, at least you know you tried and you can move on to the next thing. And if it does work like this, then heck yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, now, you've designed a lot of incredible things. Um, and I know it's hard hard to pick your favorites. I know it's it's challenging over time. But of all of the incredible things you've, you've designed and developed, which of them do you th consider, if you have one, your personal favorite? Mm, I think it's between three things <laughs> like I have this design that uh it's it's like a landscape with four like adventures walking through it and it's like in a d20 
Ooh. shape and it's on a t-shirt and I think that's like my most popular and my favorite it's just so it's like subtle but like it has you know very like fantasy vibes because of the adventures and the background so it's like if you get it you get it you know right. and, yeah, and yeah. that's my favorite kind of design like kind of subtly geeky heck yeah another, most of that wardrobe yeah, same. Yes. <laughs> another one definitely is like this uh, print it's like the the alchemist print one of the first ones that I did. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was like inspired by an alchemist uh, character that I had. And I thought, what would they have, you know? And Mm -hmm. then I decided to make it a pattern. And it just, it's another one of my most popular ones and definitely one of my favorites. And also my role with Pride Pin. Mm -hmm. I I have one of those. I love it. Yeah, I designed with (laughs) Kristoff from Cantrip Candles. Yeah. Um, So that's definitely like one of my favorites. Good choices. Good choices. Uh, (laughs) Now, I know I'm super biased because I own a few of your shirts and your pins because you have just incredible designs. Just amazing, mind-blowing. Like you said, subtly geeky. I feel like that's the kind of thing that we gravitate towards these days. So I got to know what your design process is like. How do you come up with these subtly geeky designs? Like... uh, It's really hard to pinpoint how. (laughs) (laughs) Like... uh, the other day, I really wanted to design something for monks. So I was like, monks, hands, you know, like, they're always, like, doing things with their hands. So I asked my husband to, like, hold a D20 and, like, do this and do that. And, like, he's you know, like this. And then with that, I just, like, started designing until something came out. <laughs> and usually, like, that that's how it goes. It's like, I have these vague ideas, like, hands doing D&D things and, like... Um, I usually go to Pinterest and I see what kind of aesthetic am I going with, you know, mm-hmm. like, because I really like a monoline, very clean designs or like super colorful. <laughs> like those are like the two things I like. So definitely it's just like a kernel of an idea. Like I remember I was mm-hmm. watching Critical Role <laughs> and Matt said something like, let's do some damage. I think it was a long mm-hmm. time ago. And I was like, that's a cool shirt. You know? yeah, I love it. <laughs> so it's just like I, I'm listening to a podcast or I'm watching something and suddenly it's like oh <laughs> that that would be a cool design that's awesome that's awesome like, and p- part of the reason that we do this show is both to get people to to find out about all these great things and also for me and Mika to learn about a bunch of cool things that maybe we didn't find out so like I've seen your designs many times and and now that I have the knowledge of where this is don't be surprised if a big order comes your way very soon <laughs> um, but now this is your full time aspect on your store. This is this is where it's all going in, and you've you're preparing for whatever the next thing may be. What would that next thing be? What is next for Paula's Pixels? <laughs> I'm really trying to develop my Patreon because I would love to do a monthly pin club. So like every month there's a new pin design, but like I need. <sighs> enough people <laughs> to do that so like i really i'm pushing that because right now my patreon is like a sticker club mm-hmm. so every month people get you know like i do a different sticker design but i want to like next level pins like one pin design every month and so like that's my next project for sure hear that folks hear that folks you hear that folks? get <laughs> get on our patreon so you can get yourself some free pins all of you just let's do a run. pin club i love pins you yeah, heard it from us too. let's do it let's do it <laughs> well this has just been such a delight. I, I tell the story to friends a lot, and I don't know if I've told you this story, but when I heard I was going to guest on Critical Role, I went on Etsy and I was like, what is the best shirt to wear for like a guest episode of Critical Role? And I found mm-hmm. your shirt and I have just been obsessed with your work ever since. So it is an absolute honor to get to talk to you. And I would like to let everyone know who is watching this and would also like to dress cool and have your things. Where can the folks at home find you? What are what are your links and your ww dots well my my store is paulaspixels.com which is p-a-o-l-a <laughs> you know, pixels.com that can get a little complicated but on twitter <laughs> i'm at uh e-rail, which is also complicated i wasn't thinking when i picked my names no, i-r-r-e-l <laughs> perfect <laughs> on twitter <laughs> We'll make sure to have lower thirds so everyone yeah. can screenshot it and write it down and go yeah. immediately and follow exactly. it. Sure, follow if you Google like Paula's pixels, I'll come up. True. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> 
Well, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us and for all the amazing work that you do in this community. Please keep it up. And uh, yeah, I'm going to probably start carving out a section of my closet for your work. So thank yeah, you Well, thank that. you so yeah. much. <laughs> Well, thank you all so much for joining us for this amazing return to Critter Hug for the year 2021, uh, where we got to talk with some amazing, talented people. Mm -hmm. We got to gush over their work, and then we got to uh, gush over Vampire Diaries briefly. So yes. uh, there you go, double whammy. Double uh, whammy. <laughs> hey, it uh, fit. We talked about vampires. Exactly. They have diaries. It's We're all theme. on track here. It's on theme. It's, it's on good. theme. Yeah, miss it's you, all girl. good. I miss you, Matt. But this is such a good little taste of getting to see you. I feel like with each Critter Hug episode, we get more and more chaotic. I'm very excited to see where the clipping for this advertisement for this episode is going to come from. Oh, yeah. If, if, we, if we keep this going for a few years, by the end of it, we're going to be like that that crazed old couple at the end of the street that all, all, all the kids don't go near their house. You know, they're just like, what? What? A few Careful. years, Matt. That's like two episodes from now. Like, we're getting there. We're really getting there. If the gray hair tells me anything, we're getting there. Matt, <laughs> I have gray hair. I'm 26. Where is it coming from? It's coming from 2020. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. We'll be gray together. We'll all hang out and show off our grays, and then and then we'll be fine. It's true. What if we all turn into silver foxes? <gasps> Wait. I think gray hair is hot. I'm just saying. Gray hair is like, hot. You got nothing Matt, to worry about. We're all going to be Siri from The Witcher all at once. I and mean, yes. 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 We're all going to be witchers. I love it. Let's do this. <laughs> Thank you, 2020. You've given us one good thing. We're one all going to be I witchers. <laughs> Oh, oh, thank oh. you so much. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. <sighs> and it's good to see all the critters, albeit we can't see them, but I, I well, thank, feel them out there. Yeah, thank you for being here with us and celebrating these wonderful, wonderful people. Yeah. Go hug Love. yourself, everybody. Go hug yourself. Mwah. Love you all. <laughs> Matt, I did. I went way too hard into Vampire Diaries. I went in as a joke. I remember I seeing like, your tweet uh -huh. about the joke of it. Yeah. I was like, I was like, oh, interesting. And then just seeing you plummet into the depths of the earth on it, I'm like, okay, I can't I judge. I don't know if it's because I'm in quarantine or because Ian Sommerhalder is the hottest man I've ever seen on the face <laughs> of this fucking planet. <laughs> Ooh, 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 ooh